Welcome to the Ohio Arts Council's Rife Gallery. This is the programming series for the current exhibition, The Nexus of Art and Health, curated by Sienna Brown. Today, we are thrilled to present artist Andrea LeBlanc. Brief reminder, everyone tuning in today is in listen-only mode, so feel free to use that chat function to ask any questions you might have, and we'll get to those at the end during the Q&A session. Also, please keep in mind, we are presenting from separate locations, so if the bandwidth kind of fluctuates a little bit, thank you in advance for bearing with us. All right, lastly, to get everyone comfortable, if you wouldn't mind just popping into that chat feature, saying hello and letting us know where you are tuning in from. Okay, thanks everybody. And now to you, Andrea. Great, well, thank you so much, everyone uh, who is watching right now. Um, and also I wanna say a big thank you to the Rife Gallery for Kat Sheridan and um, Sienna Brown for putting this really amazing show together. So I wanted to say thank you. It's a really beautiful show for Clevelanders. I hope you have a chance to go down to Columbus to see it. It's still up for a little while until January, ooh, the beginning of January. So there's a little more time. Okay, so I'm just going to uh, go pretty much chronologically with um, some, some work and we'll talk um, of course about each piece. But um, first of all, I would like to, um, hmm, um, I don't know why my, um, this pop-up is coming up but I guess I'm going to, I think that will disappear, I hope. Uh, okay, you know what, let me just back up one. Ah, darn. Andrea, feel free well, to go ahead and uh, minimize if you need to click that. Okay. It's totally yeah. okay. Okay, yeah. sorry about that, thank you. I don't know why for some reason this keeps popping up. I don't know even, hmm. um, I'm just gonna, I'm going to just keep going because I think it did disappear after a, a minute. I'm sure those more tech savvy people will um, understand how to do this, but I'm sorry, not that tech savvy. Um, but I did, do want to just uh, give you a little bit of background on my um, history and uh, education. I think the, the line that's missing is I graduated from the Cleveland Institute of Art in uh, 1995, and also um, have a degree in uh, K through 12 teaching, which I received um, in 2003. And I am currently teaching at the Cleveland Institute of Art and at Cuyahoga Community College. And I've been in um, at Tri C for mm, close to 18 years now, and at um, the Cleveland Institute of Art for about five or so. So it's been a little while and also receiving some awards. This is just a short, um, short little recap. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and jump right into some work. As I mentioned, um, a lot of these pieces are starting out from right after I graduated from college, but I think it's really interesting to see how artists progress with their work over the years. And there's often some themes that will be present throughout the work. And I think it's interesting to see that. So even though I think some of these pieces I, I, I still really like, some of them I think are just a starting idea that I have developed further as I've moved along. So this idea, um, right, this piece in particular I did while I was in college, um, um, and I'm still fascinated by, this idea of a larger mass with smaller, um, additional pieces that will then fit within the larger mass. So it refers very much to seed pods. And even I think I, I am con continually intrigued by the human body. So cells within the body, or even um, uh, maybe the start of um, a zygote within a womb, I think these themes have come along pretty much from the right the beginning of my work. This was about um, yeah, in 1995. So this is many years ago, but I still feel like this is uh, relevant for what I'm working in today. All right. Um, similar uh, idea of larger elements, uh, a very big heavy mass, and a smaller piece that is inserted within that mass. And so some of the scale is uh, large. This is um, probably about close to two feet tall. It's pretty massive. 
And then there's a smaller insert within. Um, and the same with this next one, I have two larger sculptural pieces, which again are pretty large, about two feet or so um, wide. And I was playing a lot with some, rather than a clay element that is additional, what else can I do other materials? Um, and I really wanted to use glass. At the time, I didn't have any facility to uh, cast glass. So I used glycerin instead, which has a really nice quality. It does look glass-like. Uh, the only trouble is it's impermanent. So I'm glad I have this photo um, for my records because I think after a couple of years, the glycerin will break down, it discolors. And I would love to revisit some of these ideas and actually cast in glass, maybe. And now that I, I'm working at the Institute, I can do this. I just, it's a matter of uh, time really to do it. So um, this may look large, but it's actually a very small handheld piece. And I made a whole series of works called toys that you can, it's more um, personal. I can play with it, um, insert and flip it around and play with different um, uh, positions with the, these two pieces and how they fit together. But this idea of something fitting together, I, I find really intriguing. Um, a larger but similar form and similar idea of a larger piece that then has a smaller resting element on the inside. And just a quick note for te uh, technique, these are all slab built ceramic pieces. Um, <clears throat> I do teach throwing and I love to throw, but I feel like most of my, um, I don't know, important pieces or pieces that I feel like I can move along with my concepts and ideas are with hand building. I just feel like I have more variety. I have more ability to make different shapes more quickly with hand building. So pretty much everything I think I'm going to show you today is hand building. <clears throat> and here's another larger vessel, which again, this is pretty, pretty large, almost torso size. Again, I think about the body and how these pieces relate to the body. So I can wrap my arms around this like a giant big belly. It has a lot of weight and mass. This is hollow though. So it's it's made to look very thick and substantial, but all these pieces are hollow. There's an interior and an exterior form. And then I'm making these small elements. This one is very much about an idea of a zygote, two cells or the initial cell that is starting to break apart to create two. And again, kind of womb-like, I think of this one um, personally. So after college, it took me a few years to find a studio that really felt um, comfortable. I popped around at a number of different places, but um, right around uh, 1999, I um, met up with some uh, really wonderful women and um, joined Terra Vista Studio. So I've been at Terra Vista now for, yikes, over 20 years, it's been a while. This is a nice uh, entryway view. It's been a great studio space. And for anyone that is new to, um, new as an artist, I think it's so important for ceramics in particular, but really for any type of art to have a community that you can bounce ideas off of, um, work things out for ceramics. It's very tech heavy. So we need to have lots of equipment and we share because it is very expensive. So sharing the studio with other people, other ceramic artists really helps a lot um, for many things. It makes it more, more doable. It's much more realistic um, for, for rent and also just to share equipment and even help if I have a large piece I need to flip over, which I'm making pretty large pieces now. I can't do it myself. I need someone to help me flip these big pieces over, which I, I bug my studio mates all the time. And here's another view um, of just the where my workspace is. We share, um, like I said, is four, uh, five rather, other artists, and we each have a quadrant of the studio. But it's I'm very lucky. It is a beautiful space, and the sun coming in. We get the beautiful uh, sunsets. It's 
pretty spectacular. But the downside is it's incredibly hot in the summer, no air conditioning, and freezing cold in the winter. So it looks great, but mm, sometimes it's a little difficult to work in the studio. Um, so I want to um, transition to once I moved into that studio, I started really thinking about work a little differently and what was inspiring me at the time, and again, still continues to, is um, the idea of really graphic patterns and Amish quilts. So this particular piece is from uh, 1910, but I think it looks like it could be current today. Um, there's a really wonderful classic um, quality that does, I think, hold up really for, for years and years. And for me, the idea of it's is very um, um, symmetrical, but also dynamic at the same time. I find these just really beautiful. Here's another one. Um, the play of subtle color, I think, I find is also very inspiring. So very subtle palette, but it does create a lot of um, visual, in my mind, it's like a little bit of visual tension with the red against the blue and green. I find these to be just uh, really stunning, um, 1940s. And again, the um, unfortunately, the, the quality of this image is not great, but the chevron pattern I find so incredibly, um, for me, I just love this so much. And I love in, in, uh, really incorporating a lot of texture with uh, visual texture and visual pattern with my work. So I find this to be an inspiring piece. And to Guy's Bend, um, these quilts, if if you, some of you may or may not know about the quilters of Guy's Bend, but they're really worth uh, researching and looking up if you don't know much about them, but incredible, incredible work. There are so, this is 1960s, um, but again, there's this classic quality, I think what is really special about these Gaze Bend quilts, they're not quite as rigid as some of the Amish quilts, although the simplicity and formality of the Amish quilts I think are really exciting. This has um, such a looseness and uh, life to it. Again, it's very subtle play of color and pattern, but it's really visually so exciting. I just love these um, quilts. Um, so that really does inspire this new body of work. Um, I think you can definitely see some of that quilt pattern, but taking that and how can I make this into a three-dimensional form? So using some of the same um, patterns actually, and a lot of when I create these, I am making them almost exactly like I was working with fabric. So I cut paper patterns as I would cut um, uh, clothing. And using these patterns on my slabs, I can then make these pieces very precisely so they will fit all together. Um, it is not uh, easy, it's still very precise, but um, you can get a lot of really nice results, of course, this way with patience. And here's another one. So thinking about not only these inserts that can then be removed from the interior, uh, from the piece, almost like the bowls that I had earlier. Um, they're a bit more about function, but still pretty sculptural. And thinking about that play of subtle color and, and to play off of the pattern. And um, again, some of them get a bit more complex. Um, also, I am, again, referencing some fabric. So I am creating a, um, and I have another slide coming up, carving into linoleum and rolling my slab of clay on that linoleum to get a fabric-like pattern. And I've been doing this for a number of years. This is, um, I don't actually have the date of this, but this is probably about 15 years ago. I started working with this technique and I absolutely love it. I use it for a lot of my work for sculpture and for functional work. I'm gonna, um, move on. So here's an example of that pattern um, and the slab of clay. So once I sketch out my design on the linoleum, and it's that it's easy cut linoleum, you can get it at any art supply store. It's very soft. 
So using printmaking tools, I'm carving into the linoleum and then I'm pounding the slab with my hand onto that linoleum. And then I peel the slab off so that it does leave that um, reverse imprint. And again, it's, I, I find it, um, I'm very much attracted to texture and surface and with slabs, it's hard to break up that surface. So I find this to be a great technique. Uh, my only um, challenge is, you know, you can only get this linoleum so large. So how, um, to work at a larger scale, I have to change how I create surface design. But I think this works really well for smaller scale pieces. And here's another one, again, using that same um, linoleum technique for the bottoms of these. And with very careful planning of my paper patterns, I can come up with some pretty precise um, and visually interesting pieces that all will come apart and then go back together again. And even more complex, as I continued along this path, I think they did get more and more complicated maybe more um, mechanical possibly, or um, um, sometimes I, I, I think eventually I felt like they were getting a little bit cold. I was losing some of that freshness. So I um, think I have one more. I think at this point, I started to feel like I was losing my initial interest in this form um, and I needed to take a break, but I, Again, I think coming back, taking a break as an artist and coming back to some of these themes with a fresh eye is really helpful. So I took, took a little time off um, from once I felt like I was getting too stiff and did some different things, um, which one of those things is, I will lead to, is um, trying to make money as an artist. I think this is really important that um, so often we don't realize um, uh, when you're a young artist in college, you think, oh, it, it'll be a snap. I'll be able to make money, no problem. Everyone's going to want to buy my work. It'll be great. But it's a little harder than it uh, may seem. I teach at two schools and um, try to make work doing street festivals. It's a lot of um, effort, lots of running around, but doing all these things together does help. It helps to have two bodies of work. So sculptural work that is great for pre presenting in galleries and then functional work that I can make a little quicker and sell at some street festivals, which um, at this point in my life, I, I would be happy to never do another street festival. Um, they can be a lot of work, but um, it's good when you're starting out. So some early work that I made for uh, functional and sellable items, they're much more glossy, shiny, um, but still using the same technique. So using the linoleum to get pattern in the clay and again, pattern in the clay and a slightly different form. Um, and then to more currently, I am still creating pieces that are a bit more um, commercially sellable. And so this is what I'm doing now. So um, shifting a little bit away from the, the very shiny, I'm really responding more to more neutral and matte glazes, but still keeping a soft form. And these are really enjoyable to make. And I think, again, it's not that one is better or worse. They're just different when you're really in depth with a, um, a pretty intense sculptural theme or project, it's nice to take a break and do something that's more about process. It's It kind of loosens up some of those ideas, I think. And here's some more of uh, similar current pieces that I'm working on now, um, just more matte glazes and subtle surface design. Um, so thinking about just what is inspiring uh, as an artist, I think, Driving around Cleveland, there's so many interesting uh, structures and I find um, architecture really interesting. I particularly love this. It's um, from a salt mine out at Mentor Headlands. If you've ever been out that way, you drive right by it as you go into the, to the beach. And I, I don't actually know how this operates with salt, but I know it is part of the salt mine. But here's this really kind of interesting, massive, 
house, simplified house structure, almost precariously tipping on the top of this wire, um, very delicate framework underneath. It's so interesting to me. And I think pulling some of these ideas into my own work, um, I think is, is interesting. So uh, this is still a bit more of a cross between functional and sculptural, these larger um, platter forms, but working with some wire and that wire is embedded into the clay itself to continue the visual line of the incised um, slip design. And this is canthal wire, which can withstand the heat of the kiln. So I put that in when the clay is still soft. And I have another example of um, using a thin inscribed line, which I then inlay black slip and scrape it off um, if you're following that process. Um, and then using the wire to connect those um, drawn lines. It's subtle, but I think I really like to play off of the massive quality of the clay with this thin wire. And it really refers to drawing. I, I think of it that way. Here's another one on a vase form. So a similar idea of a drawn line and the wire form. Um, so back to some sculptural work. Um, this is a bit more um, somewhat recent within the past 10-ish um, years or, or less. Um, but going back to the idea of that I started with um, right after college, a larger bowl element and how can I have an insert that is playing off of this mass that can then be removed um, this extra part that without it, the piece is not complete. Here's a close up of um, the same piece. So if you look directly inside, these lines will all connect. And another larger, massive piece. This is again um, hollow on the inside, even though it looks like it is solid, it is two bowls with a um, the top is then applied many, many slabs of clay. So that way it's, it is, um, you can lift it up and it won't um, blow up in the kiln. And here's another one of a similar form, a uh, slightly different color, and I incorporated an inner um, piece inside. So again, same idea of this um, larger form that that star shape does pull out and it reveals a small square um, opening that then the star fits back into and it kind of locks it into place in effect. Um, the size of these, again, this is a bit larger, maybe um, about 18 inches wide. And again, hollow formed and then slab cut and added along that top edge. Um, this piece is about the same um, size, about um, 18 inches or so wide, but um, this piece is called pollen. And I think it um, does represent the idea of that pollen, um, little pollen microscopic piece that gets implanted in our noses and lodged in there. I have a close up of that. Um, this piece of course is removable. But I think what I really liked about it, the entire piece, um, the exterior bowl element was constructed with hexagon shapes that mimic the hexagon of um, the, the small insert. So it, it's very much a smaller is to greater idea. And playing with this hexagon idea, again, um, more so molecules and thinking about cells and how cells develop and build upon each other. And even bubbles that um, they suppose uh, that the first cells came from bubbles. I don't know if any of you have ever heard of this theory, but um, a bubble has an interior and an exterior and a cell is the very same way. And they, they think, of course, no one knows, that very early, early cell formation came from this idea of a bubble and how that bubble um, create can uh, have an interior and exterior and it can be different and that's how cells work. Um, this is a non-scientific way of describing 
I'm, <laughs> mm, um, anyway, so um, a quick studio shot working on these pieces. Um, the light happens to be beautiful here. Um, this photo is from Angelo Marandino, who, Marandino, who is an incredible photographer, who is also in our building. But this is a work in progress, and I'll show you the, um, here is another example of a work in progress showing the construction of some of these pieces. So sometimes the inner structure I found to be almost more interesting than when I added my slab on the exterior to cover it up. So I was playing with how can I reveal the structure? How is that structure creating the form? And what can I do to make that a little bit more interesting? So this piece then becomes this, as you can see the slab built um, elements, each triangle and, and um, each little shape is fitted together to create the larger form. Um, and something that I will continually continually be interested in is um, the structures of construction or deconstruction in Cleveland. Everywhere you look, there's something being torn down and something being constructed. But looking at that internal structure, I find so interesting and fascinating. And whenever I'm working with my own pieces, I think about that internal structure. How is that putting, the, um, creating the piece, um, the actual slabs? How are, am I putting them together in such a way, almost like how architecture and floors and I beams, how is it keeping the piece together? Like this building, you see all the internal um, wires being decomposed. But normally, of course, we're walking in these buildings, we never think of it. It's holding us up, but you would never know. Um, this piece, I think, refers to the idea of that internal structure. How are these slabs fitting together? How is that um, connecting and to, to reveal that connection? So again, a close up of that. Um, this uh, shifts a little bit to a new body of work that I um, made really for the wall. So I think deep down, maybe many of us ceramic artists might have a little bit of jealousy for painters that I always want to have pieces on, on the wall. I think that something uh, changes when you have um, a piece of ceramics on a table, it's functional. As soon as you put it on the wall, it does change it into something that's more sculptural. So um, having something on the wall, for me, it, it does change the um, idea. And I can really play with concepts that I wouldn't normally play with, like color and pattern and thinking about it as a, as a canvas, really, in a way. But what can clay do that canvas can't do, it can be three-dimensional. So how can I do shallow dimension and um, get that uh, painterly quality, but with ceramics? Here's another one, which again, it's a very, it's a shallow um, platter, but I think of it very painterly as, as a wall piece with very faint incised lines I, and a very muted palette which I am gravitating towards much more right now. Um, similar piece, a similar idea of, it could be laid out on the table, but it is meant to be um, hung as well. So it's all wired to hang. And you going back to some incised line and drawing on that clay surface, referring to the molecular ideas of um, cells and, um, and some internal structures, even bodily structures. So more recently, playing with, um, going back to the idea of a three-dimensional like bubble idea and cell, but giving it a bit more of an environment. Um, so revisiting some similar ideas. So which really does bring us right to most recently in COVID. And uh, we've all been living through this crazy time. And I think so for so many of us uh, in the heart of COVID, I really was not making much artwork. I just felt so overwhelmed 
with so much going on, it was very hard to concentrate in the studio. And I think a lot of my fellow artists were in the same boat. I just kind of, I would go in and I would just feel stumped. I, I just didn't know what to do. Um, so I was making, I don't know, like throwing cups and making uh, tableware, things that were easy, I didn't have to think about. So it's taking two years to really start to develop, like, what are my thoughts about these, this COVID time? And what, what's my takeaway? Um, and I was doing some research, mainly because of being invited to the show and really thinking about, well, when am I going to reflect on years later about COVID? And the idea of um, being contagious is so huge. I think that we have become so fearful of people that are contagious and what does that mean? And I thought, well, it's actually not just bad things that are contagious, but good things are contagious too. We can have contagious joy, contagious laughter. These things are contagious ideas. So it can be a really great idea and it does spread throughout a population or um, happiness. If one person walks into a room that's really happy, it does permeate the whole group and makes everyone feel the same. So it's interesting, but then how that does spread amongst groups. I think these maps were so interesting to me. Um, and here's another one, the idea of cultural diffusion and how different cultures, um, America is like an incredible example of that. We have people constantly coming in with new ideas and new concepts and spreading those ideas. And um, how does that change in a population? Uh, so that was very inspiring to this body of work I have at the Rife Gallery right now. And I'll show you a few images. Um, I took these photos myself, so they're, they're not as good as professional shots, but just to show you what I'm doing currently and how the idea of this maps of diffusion and where, how we navigate through them. And I would like the viewer to think of them almost like a map, um, possibly. Here's another one, uh, not, not a great slide, but it's, it gives you an idea of where I was going with this. You know, maybe it's a little bit bad with some of, of course, being contagious with a cold with COVID is not good. So there's both, it's both good and bad, the idea of contagion. So it's just a very interesting concept to me, I think. Um, let's see here. Uh, and this also is at the Rife um, Gallery right now, but I think it does, it's a nice resolution. It, it refers back to those very early pieces I made um, right out of uh, college where I'm making little toys that you could then pick up and play with. They're handheld objects that you could roll in your, in your hands, almost like worry stones with different textures and patterns but then they go back into this larger vessel. So it's, it's still interactive. You can still play with them. Um, I think no matter how long I'm working with clay, I'm going to have some of these same ideas will keep coming back over and over again. And looking, you know, getting a slideshow together right now, I, I realize some ideas that I, I feel like, okay, I'm ready to revisit and I'm excited to continue working on some uh, earlier ideas, I feel like I didn't quite, um, um, I wasn't able to properly um, develop as much as I would like. And I think that might be, <laughs> that might be it. I think I maybe was talking perhaps too fast. So um, sorry about that. But I guess there's a little time for Q&A if you guys have any um, questions. I think you have some really um, intrigued audience members who were having some comments earlier. And of course we can talk play all day. Um, so I'm gonna read you a couple of comments from earlier. Uh, yeah. Elise said, absolutely stunning. The colors and composition. I'm amazed how everything is hand built yet symmetrical. Um, and then Shalmet, uh, asked about the wire, and I think yes. was able to answer that Kemper brand. No, H Hannah, Kemper brand wire, is that right? The yes. Wire? So if you, absolutely, you're welcome to, um, you can get it online. Kemper makes, I think they call it um, like um, 
flower or of stamen wire or something. So people would use it for ornaments. Um, I mean, you can really use it for anything, but that's exactly what I use. Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, I will say though, if you do buy some, you want, uh, it works better the higher gauge wire. I think it's 18 gauge, if I remember correctly. Also, you really can't fire it much hotter than about cone 04, so lower temperature. If you fire it much hotter, it starts to decompose. It's still there, but it's very fragile. So it'll crumble if you touch it. That's the only downside. Thank you. Um, Elise also commented on one of the works that you had up, um, saying that it's the piece that they love the most from your body of work. Everything fits within it perfectly. It's called The Nest 2016. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So plenty of great comments. I, I love that you talked um, quite a bit about process, but I'd also love for you to talk a little bit more about um, like, so using the wire, obviously then those pieces are lower fired. So what does that mean? And, and why is that important to you? Um, how does that come into your work? Right. Um, I, I think uh, the lower temperature, uh, this, again, just some technical information, that lower temperature does provide uh, some benefits. So I am able to have a slightly broader color palette. It's easier to get brighter colors. Um, also the stress on the clay, the larger, um, at least as far as I have been working, the larger the pieces, the lower that temperature, it does seem to keep the piece from cracking, from having any structural damage. The hotter the temperature, there's more stress on the clay. So I tend to fire a little bit cooler, especially for the sculptural work. Anything that I'm doing for function, I want it to be hot because much hotter, cone six or cone 10, that's more food safe. But these are sculptural pieces, so it's really okay if they're lower temperature, but that does help quite a bit. Thank you, thank you for that. Um, so I am curious, the, the um, forms that you're making as more of like the, the um, more commercial forms that you're making that you mm -hmm. said, um, they're almost those pod-like shapes, right? Are yeah. those, um, are you creating molds and then pressing into that or are those uh, slab? Well, well, they're all slab, well, actually, that's a good question. Some of them, it just depends. Um, you know, I, I like to think that there's, um, and I tell this to my students all the time, there's no um, really right way or wrong way. Whatever gets you the end result is, is what you do. It, it, however you get there, it doesn't matter. So sometimes I do use just different sizes of bowls that I get at the thrift store. So I'll just lay my slab in a bowl and then pop it out. Sometimes I'll even just do two pinch pots and then slip and score those together. And sometimes I'll throw them on the wheel and do it that way. They're all perfectly fine methods. I think a lot of ceramic people um, get hung up where it's like everything must be constructed the same way, but, but you don't, you can, however it comes out, it does not matter. Um, the end result is really, and, and for me, it's what do I feel? Do I feel tired of being on the wheel? Maybe I wanna do hand building. So whatever I feel like for that day, really. So for folks, entering into clay as a medium that they have curiosity, interest, or are trying to hone their skills. Um, you mentioned quite a few things that I think are really helpful, but if you could narrow down to maybe one or two things that have been really helpful for you in breaking through into um, yeah. new ventures. Or yeah. Great question. I think that's a really good question. I remember when I was a student and watching um, other artists give talks, it, I was always really interested in how did they transition after college into a professional career. I think that's a really hard thing for a lot. I see that even now that a lot of recent grads, it's tough. I think those first couple of years when you're out of college, it's easy to float around and not know what to do. And it's really also easy to fall into a nine to five job that doesn't offer you the time to be in the studio. So what is a good trend? How does, how does one do that? I think trying those first couple of years, trying lots of different things, you know, 
trying to share a studio with someone or seeing if you can set up a home studio. I think having a place to work is really crucial. So what I did as soon as I graduated almost as immediately, I tried moving into different studio spaces right away because I knew if, if I'm dedicating a small portion of my, my rent money goes to a studio space, I am going to use that studio. This is just me. I think some people can work at home, but for me, the, the separation of a separate studio that I actually go to, it means as I'm getting there, I'm going to work. And then I go home, I go home to relax. Having a separate space, and I know, again, with COVID and when we were working at home a lot, it's very hard for people to, how do you change from work mode to home mode? So I really need a separate space, but also with clay, it is, it can be toxic. You don't want to be breathing all this clay dust in your home. So if you have a separate garage, maybe that's better, but I really do think it's better to have a separate space to go to. Um, I think being a painter or some other materials are fine to work at home. Um, but I think key is as soon as you get out of school, if you can scrounge to have a tiny little studio space, that is so critical. If you don't do that, then it's very easy. One week goes by, two weeks go by, you're not making anything. And if I'm not paying for a studio, it doesn't matter. I don't need to make anything, right? So I think, well, I am paying for a studio. I need to at least make enough money in sales to pay my studio rent in theory. Um, that doesn't always happen, but um, that's, that's the goal. It's more motivating. I know I have to make work. I have this place to make work. Hopefully that helps. We have some really good questions. I'm gonna go ahead and ask you. Well, first is the comment. Um, uh, Shulamit said, awesome and inspirational. Thank you. Uh, Janet said, beautiful, Andrea. So wonderful to see the broad scope of your work. Um, Elise said, do you, or asked, do you mix your own glazes? And do you have any thoughts on the glazes you chose for your newest body of work at the Rife Gallery? Great, well, that's a great question. Um, yes, I use both glazes I've developed and commercial glazes. And I think for a lot of artists, ceramic artists do probably a, a little bit of both. Commercial glazes are great because they're, you just order them online and there they are. But the downside is they look very commercial. So what I've done over the years is I have a small batch of probably between mm, maybe five or six of my own glazes that I've developed. And then I layer multiple um, glazes to get a desired result. So I'll use my homemade glaze, I'll layer a commercial glaze. The other thing I do a lot, which I haven't mentioned, is I refire so many times. So I'm really picky about my surface and I will fire the same piece sometimes four times just to get the surface right. So I will layer a glaze, comes out, I don't quite like it. I'll put another layer of glaze, fire it again, come out. So it's a lot, it's, it's a slow process, but I'm very particular. And I, I like the idea of a glaze that almost looks, I like to think of it almost like skin or like very thin layers of, um, of glass maybe. So you can sort of see through to what's happening underneath, but it's a little bit obscured. So like this really thin, Many layers are like varnish when you're using oil paint. There's a lot of thin layers to create this luminous depth. That when it works well, it looks great, but it takes some time and it doesn't always work. Sometimes the glaze crawls or flakes or crazes. C ceramics is hard. There's no way around it. That is true. And you just used some uh, ceramic terms that not everybody would necessarily know. So crazing and crawling. Crazing. And yeah, so crazing is where you see this fine network of, I'm sure you've seen on old plates, it'll look like crackle pattern. And then crawling is the opposite. The glaze will peel away from the back of the clay and you'll see raw bits of clay. So you don't want that, that does not look good usually. But some artists use it as a, an effect. So that is something you can do if you are, um, if you're really playing, that's great. 
So David asked, uh, thinking about Amish and African-American quilts, do you feel your work resonates with any particular school or style of art? Boy, that's a hard question. Um, I don't, I don't know. Um, I think we all have inspiration and I'm, I'm definitely inspired by, um, I, I love the simplicity of Amish uh, quilts and, and shaker and a lot of this um, kind of a similar aesthetic in the craft movement in particular. Um, but I mean, honestly, if I go to the museum, any single room I go into, I feel like there's something I'm going to enjoy and I'm going to be inspired by. And I think that happens with so many of us. You know, I think, oh, I just want to, I'm going to just look at this one gallery today. And and then I, no, it's not going to happen. I'm going to keep going and getting something from each. I think we pick and choose all over the place. I, I couldn't pin it down to one particular um, style that is inspires me. And I don't know if I, hmm, I don't know if I could say what my style is. That's that's too hard. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right, Connie says, uh, I love your work, Andrea. It's inspirational to see how your work shifted over the years and your influences. I love the line and pattern work. I'm curious how drawings influence your work. Hmm, that's a great question. Um, Again, I think deep down, I, I want to be a painter uh, and drawing is um, critical for that. You know, I don't know why. I think this is a direction that I should explore more. Why am I not doing it more? I'm not sure. I, I really want to develop that more. I think I'm a little afraid to for some reason, like, why not? There's no no right and wrong, but I just haven't quite developed that. Um, but you know what? Life is long and who knows what the next few years, what directions will I'll go in, but I'm going to definitely think about that. So, so we have a, a, I think a relatively impossible question, but I'm really curious what your answer will be. Oh, no. Greg would like to know, what do you think the last piece you make in your life will look like? Wow. That's an incredible question. Holy cow. I'm not sure. Um, I, well, I will say, I hope that I will be doing this for as long as I'm able to. And even if I'm uh, in a bed that I cannot leave, I would say, please bring me some clay and I'll make pinch pots if that's what I can do. Absolutely. I want to do this, uh, work with this material for as long as I can. And I do have some students um, actually recently, some older students that have finally said they just are retiring from clay because they are not really able to do it anymore, either from arthritis in their hands or some, for some other reason. And I've talked with them, actually a student just recently, we, she has really bad arthritis, but she's incredibly creative. And I think for her, she's just doing a different material. She's doing more drawing and she's doing other things. So she's still keeping her hands in it, but it's a different medium. So if I can't do clay, then I'm hoping I want to be able to do whatever I can for as absolutely as long as I possibly can. I'll, whatever that work is, I'm not sure. That's a great question, though. So uh, something that I like to ask artists, and particularly um, artists who are really involved and intrigued and in love with process, is what does a day in the studio look like for you? Is there a ritual to it? Can you take us through that and what it kind of looks like, feels like, uh, maybe smells like, any of that? Sure. Yeah, that's a that's a great question. I think, um, yes, it's interesting what people's day-to-day day -day lives are. Um, I, I will say typically, um, and this may be the case for a lot of artists too, that um, I have kind of my day job is teaching. So in the morning, typically, I'm teaching until about noon. Um, and I just a, a quick word on teaching and how I, I find so much inspiration from my students. I'm going to say that right away, that I've seen incredible students come in and out of the studio. And they are so inspiring to me, coming up with ideas I never would have thought of. And a lot of times, I steal some of their ideas. Like, why not? You know, hey, I, these are things I, I say you cannot do with clay and they just do it and it works. So if it works, I think it's great. So I will say over and over again that 
teaching is so rewarding and I'm so thankful to be able to do both. If I was just in the studio only, I think it might get lonely or I don't know. I, I'm not sure I've not actually had the luxury of just being a studio artist. So I've only had teaching as well, but I'm very thankful to have it because I think it's so rewarding. So in the morning I'm teaching and then I get to the studio in the afternoon typically. And, um, you know, often it's kind of boring, tedious work that clay takes a lot of time and patience. So just getting my clay ready, wedging clay, rolling slabs. I feel like more than anything, I'm constantly rolling slabs. That's like half my job. Rolling slabs, then cutting, making patterns. Um, and then a lot of times I'll start a piece often. I, I think this is a, a good um, rule to, I read it, I cannot remember some writer, it might've been Hemingway, but could be completely wrong who said, um, never end the day at the end of a, a paragraph or at the end of a chapter. You always want to have a little bit to come back to the next day. So I don't usually finish a piece that day. I usually start something and then I know that I'll finish it when I come back the next day. So that really does help keep the momentum going. I think the hardest times for a lot of um, us artists um, I know us at the studio is when we have a big holiday sale, which we have next weekend. Um, and we have to clear out the studio and stop working, clean everything up. And it is so hard to get back to start new work. It's like your blank page. I have no idea what I'm doing. It's a really hard time. So even now I have pieces I put in bins and keep them damp so that when I come back after the holiday sale, I have something to, to keep working on. So I'm not starting from zero because each piece I think does help inform the next piece. You really need to have that continuity of work to really get um, some, some good things to happen. That's lovely. I, I love that sentiment um, as a kind of mantra of, of leaving yourself something to look forward to. That's if anybody great. knows who that, I read it years ago and it really stuck in my head. I cannot remember who, I, I know it's a writer, but I cannot remember. If anybody happens to know, um, let, let me know. Wonderful. Uh, and then we had a question from Anya and she noted in this in the firing process, um, some of the opportunity to edit is removed, but you know, you 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 fire many times. So that's not necessarily okay. true for you. Um, however, how do you handle the idea of permanence in your work? If you don't like a piece, do you just remake it entirely? Yeah, boy, that's a, such a great question. These are great questions. Thanks for asking them, uh, everyone there. Um, that's such a great question. Well, there's two ways to go. Um, I think especially now with so much more emphasis on what's happening in the environment, um, I, Again, being a teacher and seeing so many pieces come in and out of the studio, when something is fired, it is around forever. Of course, we have pots from ancient Greece. It's in theory, you could keep it forever. So I try to, if there's a piece I don't like, I try to get rid of it before that first firing. So I will then slake it down. I put it back in my slip bucket before that gets fired, it will is continually renewable. I would then slake it down. Then I can take that slaked down clay, put it on a plaster bat, and then re-wedge it and use it again thousands of times. But once it's fired, it's permanent. So, and I say this with my students too, don't just fire everything because I, I just imagine like piles and piles of terrible pots that are filling up some um our landfills here in town so make sure it looks good before you fire it um you know of course sometimes it happens where it just doesn't work um, a piece is cracks or there's a problem i just really don't like it in that case i try to and this is a good tip for any of you that are new to um, ceramics that if you don't like it don't just throw it away or give it to someone because I cannot tell you how many times I have gone to a thrift store looking through the thrift store and I see some friends pots that they may not have wanted to be at the thrift store 
many times and some really good artists that I think would not. So I try to like buy it so that it doesn't end up out. Um, if you don't like your piece, I think it's best to smash it up. And that way it doesn't get back out in the world to who knows where it's gonna go. So I think that's important. That's a really, really good thing to keep in mind. Um, and if you're having a bad day, it's great to have some pots that you just wanna smash up. So it's good to put them off to the side when you're just really wanna kind of get out some frustration. It's nice to have. It's also good to have other uh, ceramicists and artists whose opinion you value take a look at a work that doesn't uh, turn out how you expected because their fresh eyes might see something different than yours. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And we always joke is the piece that you don't like if for a sale, the, the one piece you think is just not that great, you set it up. That's the first one that sells. It's like weird. <laughs> it's very strange. It is. It, I think it's a rule. Um, yeah. So. What is next? Tell tell folks where they can look forward to seeing your work or what you're up to or um, how they can. Of course, we have this great information here on sure. the slide. But yeah, what's what's next? Yeah. Um, uh, so after the we do have a studio holiday sale um, at Terra Vista Studios. If anyone lives in Cleveland, you're welcome to stop by um, this upcoming weekend, Saturdays in a couple days, really. Um, it's been busy. And um, next up is going to be a really exciting show I am invited to be in with um, Bill Brouillard at um, the River Gallery. That'll be in spring. So we're going to do, we're starting to do some collaborations. Uh, Bill Brouillard is, was my um, professor when I was at the Institute, and he is now retired and an incredible potter, really a master potter. So it's, and I'm so excited to be able to work with him and we're doing some collaborative work, which is really fun. I have to say he's building a section and I'm building a section and we're putting things together to get, it's really been fun. So I'm so excited about that. That'll be in the spring. Wonderful. So folks, make sure you check all of those things out. Um, if you're in the area, hit up that, that show and in the spring, make sure that you go to the River Gallery. The River Gallery, and it, that will be on my website too, and I'll post, you know, but yes, yeah, that'll be, it's if you're in town. Wonderful. All right, thank you everyone again for joining us for this artist talk by Andrea LeBlanc. Andrea, thank you, this was fantastic. Um, as a part of our, our programming for this exhibition, The Nexus of Art and Health. Again, a huge thank you to Sienna Brown for putting together such a phenomenal exhibition. Thanks to the artists that participated. Um, and also a big thank you to the governor, the legislature, and the Ohio Arts Council's board who support the Ohio Arts Council, this great space, and of course, Ohio artists. Thanks everyone and have a great rest of your day.